So welcome everybody also from my side. I'm happy to be here and talk to you about uh, big data, data science challenges and some solutions. And uh, maybe while the slides are being put up, uh, I will briefly go over some of the questions. So is AI an uh, existential risk to humankind? I would say no. This is, uh, first of all, it's overrating the capabilities of AI. There always has been this dream, and we know that when we think back about fifth generation computing that was big in Japan, there was a big hype, huge expectations. We are nowhere near there, and this would take a lot of time to get there. Second, uh, also, there's a huge amount of opportunities. Uh, so it's not a risk. I rather see it as a potential solution to help us to develop further. Of course, we will need guidelines, we will need, we will need laws and, and, and ways to uh, leverage that in a meaningful way. And that includes uh, similar laws like we had also for the use of automobiles and so on, right? So society will evolve in this context, but is there a risk? I mean, there's always risks, of course, but those risks can be managed and society will, so I'm an optimist. Um, the Okay, the slides are up, <laughs> so let's uh, get into the actual talk. So I am a person who looks into data management, so storing huge amount of data. I'm actually a boring kind of guy, uh, because what I work on is I'm a plumber. So my, uh, what I'm working on is to make sure that the huge amounts of data that are being produced are processed in the right way, which is sometimes a big challenge. If you think about, uh, uh, that it's very similar to, you could argue, water. So in order to get running water, you accept that as being essential. You always want it, you're very happy to have it. But at the same time, it's actually not so trivial. You need water treatment plants, you need uh, uh, the sewage, you need uh, the, the wells, you need all the pipes that, that transfer uh, the water, that make something meaningful out of it. And uh, I'm looking at doing the same thing in information. So it's really building the data management infrastructures that are behind all those cool applications that people build. But I'm not looking at building those cool applications, I'm looking at the plumbing and really what are the challenges there. And obviously only if we have the plumbing we can build the applications. And in this context, uh, let's talk about big data. And uh, I'm sure many of you have heard about that already because big data has become a big buzzword. It's actually out already and I'll get into that in a second. Big data actually has been replaced by a new buzzword if you listen to Gartner. But uh, what uh, big data had been defined originally, you now instigated by McKinsey in, in, in a report uh, identified as the big uh, next frontier for uh, innovation and the economy as a whole. And it had been dubbed by many of the consultants uh, with three Vs, which is it's data of unprecedented volume so it's too large to be handled by existing data processing technologies, by this plumbing that we have, like the Oracle databases, the DB2 My, uh, IBM databases, or Microsoft, or choose your favorite one, Teradata. And at the same time, the data is created at a very high speed, at a very high velocity, which really means that uh, we have a high data ingestion rate, and the time, the lag time, until we want to arrive at actionable intelligence is getting shorter and shorter. We want to get more into real time. And at the same time, the data is heterogeneous. And we heard that in Irina's talk as well. Many different modalities, audio signals, video signals, text, and more structured data all together. And those had been dubbed as the challenges of big data. And big data sort of had been defined by those Vs. And even more, because any, as soon as something is a big buzzword, everybody tries to capitalize on it, right? Everybody tries to jump on it and wants to be part of it. And in the same way, uh, as you know, it was with cloud computing and many of those hypes that are generated in particular by Silicon Valley, before everybody who had to contribute a V to this mix uh, could say we, want, uh, we are doing big data. So people added extra Vs like the visualization community said we're doing visualization, that's only part of big data, it has a V. Then uh, there came other people that said, okay, we're dealing with uncertain data, so veracity is another V, so uh, it's big data. Uh, the, business computer science com uh, community or information systems community said, we have to deal with value, we have to derive value out of big data, that's another V. So anybody who has a V is doing big data sort of. No, okay, let's not be that sarcastic. Uh, but at the same time, I think actually that's not really the problem. So even though people have defined those three Vs and then added additional, uh, an additional V inflation, that's not the problem. 
The actual problem is a very different one. And that goes also or ties back to uh, Irina's talk. Uh, the problem is uh, not the Vs, because in the data management community, we have built infrastructures for dealing with those three Vs for more than four decades. The most important scientific conference that I am publishing and that many of my colleagues in that field is called the Conference on Very Large Databases, which was founded 41 or 42 years ago by now. And I always am wondering what's bigger, the big data of today or the very large data from back then. You know, it's, it's kind of funny. At the same time, the challenge really is that we are really having two worlds that are meeting. Because as I said, the, the, the big data management technologies can very easily deal with questions that are about aggregating large data sets, selecting large data sets, filtering large data sets. All of that is handled very, very well and the infrastructure exists. The problem has come at the very moment when we want to execute more complex operations on the data than just this, what, what we in uh, computer science and data management call relational algebraic operations. It really happens once we are looking at uh, applications that come from the fields of machine learning, signal processing, or advanced mathematical programming, which people nowadays hype up as artificial intelligence or whatever your new buzzword is, as said, right? Um, so, uh, what's the key about those operations? Actually, the, uh, the key in traditional data management was if you have terabytes or petabytes of data, you only want to touch them once or two or three times. So, sorting, for instance, I mean, maybe the ones of you who have learned uh, algorithms have learned that uh, sorting has a complexity of n log n in the, when, when you sort n data items. It's in practice not really true because if you have an I.O. metric, it's really the complexity of sorting is three. You have to read the data and write the data usually three times and with that you can sort with current hardware uh, petabytes of data. So, but that's a simple operation still. The problem is if we want to run more advanced machine learning algorithms like training support vector machines, like uh, uh, doing entropy maximization using something like a Lagrangian method of iterative scaling or things like that, what we actually need to do, we need to go over the data set multiple times until we reach a fixed point in order to train a model, right, in order to arrive at that. And this iterative process is something that existing technology cannot handle very well. So this is a problem. And this is really where two worlds are coming together. And that's the problem that we see in big data. There's the world of data management, which is, has been focusing on scalability, on you know, making things run on everything that reflects those three Vs and the world of much more complex algorithms. And machine learning is one representative, but not the only one. There's also signal processing, which gets more and more important when we look at high velocity data, when we look at streaming data, right? So machine learning, in my opinion, is a bit overrated in some areas. It's important, uh, but it's, and it's also interesting if you look at the Gartner hype cycle, that's really funny. So I'm not sure if you, who here knows the Gartner hype cycle? So not so many. So, the Gartner, so Gartner publishes a hype cycle. And what that really says, every technology goes through a certain cycle that starts with its inception. And it gets, uh, you know, hyped up to what is called a peak of inflated expectations. Where, you know, it's, uh, the, this technology, and it doesn't matter what the technology is, it can do everything, like uh, including world peace and so on. And then at some point of time, we notice that this technology actually does not deliver. So we get to this throw of disillusionment. And then it goes to a slow rate of adoption. And Gartner publishes every year a hype cycle for technologies. And you can look where your favorite technology, be it cloud computing, be it uh, big data, be it machine learning, be it you know, 3D printing, it doesn't matter. You can look where it's on this hype cycle. Is it in the peak of inflated expectations or is it already beyond that? And something very unique has happened with that hype cycle, interestingly, in the context of big data. Because big data went up all the way to the top of the hype cycle, passed it a little bit already, it's already going down. And then the interesting thing is it vanished. And that's actually the first time I've seen that. It was replaced by a new word. And this new word is machine learning. So it's kind of funny. So you see that uh, people are realizing that those two things are coming together. And that's exactly what my uh, remaining talk will be about. So we have the problem of Big data, which is we want to build complex models, advanced models uh, on data sets that have high volume, high velocity, and are uh, uh, highly heterogeneous, so have a high variety of variability. And we want to run iterative algorithms on those. And the question is, what is the plumbing? What's the infrastructure that we need to do this? And that leads to the next big challenge and the big problem of big data. And that's the data scientist. And uh, that was already talked about before. So the data scientist, 
according to the Harvard Business Review, is the sexiest job of the 21st century, right? So that's what the Harvard Business Review says. All data scientists are sexy. Uh, of course, um, now me being this more mundane, maybe German or whatever, I actually, again, completely disagree. To me, a data scientist is a poor beggar. It's, it's a very poor person. I mean, they earn a huge amount of money, there's no doubt about that, but there's only very, f only very few of them out there. And let's look why. So, this is why. If you look at this slide, you see what a data scientist, or what we expect a data scientist to know. So, a data scientist, on the one hand, should have competencies which I would call more mathematical, algorithmic uh, competencies, uh, methodical competencies in let's call it data analysis. This includes a lot of the aspects that Irina talked about already, uh, you know, in the areas of machine learning from support vector machines, entropy maximization. I've just written some buzzwords in the areas of mathematical programming here. Uh, that gives you an idea of the kind of skills we expect in this area. But that's not enough, because if a data scientist can do that, they only can do this on small data, right? They can do this uh, by doing, building some small static models, maybe. The problem is now what happens if those models, want, we want to incrementally change them, they're continuous, there's data streams coming in, where the data is so large it doesn't fit on a single machine anymore, you cannot use your favorite R or MATLAB application anymore. Then actually you have to worry about scalable data management, this black circle, which is really about dealing on building complex models in a, in a place where we have those three Vs. And that black circle, I again have drawn some of those buzzwords on the right side from relational algebra to memory management, parallelization, hardware adaptation, and so on. Those are the buzzwords that we also have a data scientists uh, need to know. And in addition, data science doesn't happen in an empty space. We've seen examples from Irina's talk, also I'm in Berlin, I'm leading uh, one of the two German national competence centers on big data, the Berlin Big Data Center, and we do applications in material science, in uh, information-based medicine, in information marketplaces, and many other areas, like also steel production and so on, and you also always need domain knowledge. It's very different if you build a model in, uh, let's say, something like computational neuroscience compared to uh, doing the same thing in a logistics network. You need different kind of domain knowledge. So that means in order to be a meaningful data scientist, you in addition need domain knowledge. And now it's very, very clear why actually uh, the, uh, I think actually the Wall Street Journal said that, uh, big data's big problem is little talent. And the ones of you who employ data scientists or are looking for data scientists notice it on the job market. It's really hard to find them and you have to pay ridiculous salaries for little competence very often, and you still have to train them to some degree. And the reason is, it's just too much that we ask of those people. And the fundamental problem is also, it's very hard to find people who have the aptitude in all of those areas. Because you combine, on the one hand, mathematical skills, which are really, as I said, those kind of competences, with uh, more computer science-y kind of skills in this area, and those two, are often a bit different because the people, and I notice that in my group and when I look for PhD students or postdocs or so in, in, in my group, uh, uh, what I find is you often find people who are good in math, who have the algorithmic side of things, they really don't want to do the bits and bytes programming that you have to do in order to make the scale on you know, massively parallel graphics cards or in a compute cluster where you have to worry about memory management and uh, those kinds of things. They don't like that. And in the same way, the people who like to do the bits and bytes programming, a lot of them don't really have the mathematical aptitude or the interest in doing that so much. So that's why it's so hard. And now, of course, we could try, and that's what pretty much every university nowadays tries to do, to educate those people. So pretty much every university that uh, considers themselves to be cool nowadays uh, has a data science program, data science master's program or whatever, right? Uh, again, the, that doesn't solve the problem. And it does not solve the problem because it's just too hard to do this. And I would go even further. I'm saying that uh, in the current way that we're doing, we will not be able to capitalize on big data the way we actually want to, on exploiting it, because we will not have enough talent. And the solution cannot be just to educate, because there's not enough people that we can educate that have the right skills. So we have to do a different approach. And the different approach is we have to build technology that really solves this problem. And interestingly, as always, history repeats itself. Or let's try to have history repeat itself, because actually, 
this problem had been solved in a different way, in, in a different setting before. And that was exactly in data management, in tra traditional relational database systems. We were exactly in the same situation, and interestingly, about 40 years ago. About 40 years ago, that happened. So about 40 years ago, in traditional data management, there were no relational databases. Actually, there were people had to write the data analysis programs, much simpler ones than we want to do today, right? Simple aggregation, selection, projection, relational algebraic operations. They, they had to write this in complicated languages like COBOL and so on. They had to select which index to use for which particular aggregation. You had to code the code, for instance, for even something like sorting. So, and then the relational algebra was invented. And relational algebra meant essentially a declarative way of how to specify operations. Declarative means I do not specify what, uh, uh, how to compute something, but I just specify what I want. The simple most example is in relational algebra in SQL, I say sort the data based on a particular key. Sort the data by name. This is of course easy to write and the result is a sorted result. And I don't have to write given a set, divide the set into smaller sets recursively until each set has a size only one. Once a set has a size one, compare the one element with the other element, and if one is larger than the other one, swap them, otherwise do that not, and do that recursively, which is a description of a sort algorithm. But uh, the other one just saying sort is much shorter. But that's not the real thing. It's not just much shorter. Another fundamental difference is that if I write just sort, the system itself can decide which particular sort algorithm to employ. And this is important because there is, and many of you know that, many different sort algorithms, merge sort, heap sort, bubble sort, and so on. But in practice, even those are not so important. There are some sort algorithms that work in a distributed setting, when all the data doesn't fit in a single machine, when the data doesn't fit into memory, an external sort algorithm. And if I write just sort, the database system automatically decides which sort algorithm to choose. So that means a database system like Oracle, like DB2, like uh, any others that you think of, they have many different implementations of a sort algorithm and they will choose just the right one for a particular problem. And there's a component in the database system called the query optimizer, which makes this selection automatically. It uses artificial intelligence, it uses a model of machine performance, uh, uh, solving a traditional search problem if you wish in order to make that decision. And sorting is the simple most example, by the way. It's, of course, much more complicated in the real world. Because in the real world, you have queries, like think of your practical SAP applications that join multiple data sources or tables, and you have an exponential way of combining them. And there's a huge difference in which order you combine them. It may take either seconds or hours or even days or weeks to produce a result, depending on which order you choose. And for a, a normal query plan that maybe just joins uh, a couple of tables, you easily have millions or even billions of alternative execution strategies. And the big problem is now to, to select the right one. And this is really what people invented, there was, as I said, uh, in the uh, data management field 40 years ago for relational algebra. It was solved, this problem, in the sense that there was a person named uh, uh, Ted Cott who got the Turing Award for that. He invented relational algebra. Then there was a person named Pat Salinger who came up with query optimization, the way of how to implement relational algebra efficiently without having to do systems level programming, if you wish. And uh, there were people that built declarative query languages like Don Chamberlain and so on. And they solved this problem for us. And because of that, the field of data management has become this billion dollar market that it is today. And the interesting thing is in big data, we have regressed. We have really regressed. We have moved back to the Stone Age, if you wish, because there you have to do this all yourself. You have to build the query optimizer. If people program in the tools that you would use, like uh, either you use MATLAB or R or Python, which don't scale at all, so you can only deal with small scale problems. And if you go into the large scale, it will run days, weeks, or years. Or you use complicated systems like Hadoop or Spark. And then you have to write your own query optimizer. You have to do all of that by hand, which is you do systems level programming. And this is why it's so hard. So effectively, to summarize that, in data management, we have sort of gotten rid of the black circle. So a traditional data analyst, not the data scientist that does more complicated stuff, but for the data analysts, we got rid of the black circle. They, have to, they can focus on the red one. And this enabled really all those applications that we see today, be it, you know, the ordering on Amazon, be it uh, the SAP applications that run pretty much all enterprises and so on. All of that only happened because we have this declarative language and there's form generators that generate the SQL that's being automatically optimized. Now, SQL is not enough, so we need something else, right? 
And that is really the problem, but we need technology to the rescue. That's what solved the problem, that's what unlocked the billion dollar market, and it's not gonna be educating data scientists alone. This is just a drop on the hot stone. And, and the, the magnitude of the problem you can easily see here. There's a poor guy named Matt Turk, who uh, every, and I think several times a year even, builds what he calls the big data landscape. So this is all the tools and systems, and that's exactly the reason, because you have so many different uh, you know, technologies that you need for different ways, just as you said, different sort algorithms and so on, and on that level, and, and for applications, it's just much more complicated. And that's all different tools and companies uh, that build tools that are uh, out in the big data marketplace. It's great for consultants, it's great for venture capitalists, but actually it's a huge problem for a practitioner that really wants to use the technologies. And the question is, how can we manage that zoo? And I said, the technology to automatically orchestrate that, to make this happen, that's the key. With that, I want to move to the second part of my talk and talk about something that's often a little bit misunderstood uh, uh, now that we have set up the stage, and that's about stream data processing, which is about uh, high velocity. And uh, stream data processing essentially means that uh, we want to deal with uh, continuous unbounded data. And a stream data essentially is a data with no clear beginning and end. And you could say that typically each record or event is associated with the timestamp of when it was created. And pretty much all data is originally a stream, right? Be it uh, the number of uh, orders you have in your company, the number of trucks that are moving around. They continuously change with positions and so on. It's all streams. And there's a difference between stream and batch processing. And there's a lot of confusion in the industry, in particular with those terms. So the more correct terminology is really, you want to talk about unbounded data, which is a set data that has no clear beginning and no clear end, like the number of orders on a uh, e-commerce website. And we have bounded data. And bounded data is usually data that changes very slowly or hardly at all. An example might be the number of countries in this world. You could consider this to be static for all practical purposes, even though it's obviously 100% static, but uh, that would be bounded data. And those are two different ways of, uh, and two different uh, ways of how to deal with those kinds of data. If I have unbounded data, I somehow have to discretize it. I have to create windows of this data on which I will operate on, that I will analyze. And I have stream processing and batch processing. That's two different things, because stream processing means I operate and analyze it by the way of how my infrastructure, the plumbing works, those continuous data sets. And batch processing means I operate on particular snapshots of that data. Those are two different things, and one should distinguish. So you can do unbounded uh, data processing with stream engines or batch engines. You can process bounded data with a stream engine, the batch engine, uh, and people often throw those in the same uh, basket, which is not quite true. So I said uh, bounded data would be, for instance, the current position of all trucks in a fleet. The content of a data warehouse also would be bounded because it's at a fixed point in time. And unbounded data is that customers of our products, tweets about our product, and so on. And hardly any data is bounded by nature. Mostly we bound it for practical reasons because we create a view over that data. And if we do a different view, and this is from Joe Hallerstein from Berkeley, what he was essentially saying is, you have to look at what changes faster. Your code, which is your query, the questions when I ask about the data, or does the data change faster? If the data changes faster than the code, then you have a streaming problem. If the code, that is your query, changes faster than the data, it's a data exploration problem. And the more you want to move towards real time, when you're real time, it will become eventually a streaming problem later. And just because of the complexity in this zoo that I just have shown you before, um, there is on the one hand, uh, uh, one aspect of doing batch processing over unbounded data, which means I put my data into batches and operate on each batch. And this is really an artifact. If you heard about systems like Hadoop or Spark, they do this kind of batch processing. And the reason why they do that is because it's easier to carry out, in particular, fault tolerance uh, operations on batch data. Because the traditional big data analytics technologies, in particular in the Apache open source stack, like Hadoop or Spark, uh, they rely on or, uh, having mass uh, commodity hardware being used for the data analysis and you use a large compute cluster in parallel. And the big problem that you have with those uh, commodity hardware is uh, you may get faults. 
And in order to avoid those faults, you have to do redundant computation, you have to do safe pointing and so on. And that's much cheaper if, if I operate, or cheaper to implement, uh, if I operate on a batch, on a bounded data set, essentially. However, this, of course, will limit you. Because if you operate on bounded data sets, you cannot execute any particular kind of discretization you want to do. You can only is, uh, execute discretizations over the last n records that came in. If I, however, want to monitor in a streaming data analysis system something like, let's say, all the cars on a particular street, or have other kind of windows that are not just count-based, I cannot do this. And this is where you need streaming systems, or what people they first invented is something called a lambda architecture. This is really combining something like Hadoop or uh, also uh, an, a Spark with another system like Storm, which is more of a streaming engine that processes those two things together. This is really pure legacy. You don't have to do that anymore in uh, like 2016, 2017, because you can use real streaming engines. They have advanced pretty much. They can do the fault tolerance. There's very good protocols like the Chandy Lampert protocol for fault tolerance. So you actually can solve this in streaming. Everything is really streaming in disguise anyways. And what are the benefits? The benefits are uh, that if you want to uh, implement continuous applications and never-ending data streams, there are two new things you have to worry about, and that is state and time. And with that, I want to talk about uh, one particular solution, one system that uh, originated from my research group in Berlin, originally with two PhD students, a fairly small project, and that was in 2008. So who here knows Hadoop, by the way? Who here has heard about Hadoop? So there's a couple of people here. So Hadoop, uh, for some people, has been dubbed, uh, interestingly, as uh, big data. So the synonym for big data. So if you do something in Hadoop, it's big data, or it's big data technology, and vice versa. And uh, so I was probably one of the very first users of Hadoop in 2006. The term big data didn't even exist. And back then, I found Hadoop a catastrophe. And I felt one has to be able to do things better. And I started, so once I moved left, so I was uh, working at IBM Research back then. I was at IBM Research for uh, almost nine years. And when I moved back to Germany, I felt, let's do something better. Let's build a better version of Hadoop. And we called it Apache Flink. That started with a research project that we called Stratosphere. And there we tried to combine the best of two worlds. On the one hand, the world of database technology, and I talked about that already, which is really about declarative language, query optimization, to make things easier for the data scientist. And combine this with what you know, people liked about Hadoop. And there's a couple of things that are really good about it. The first thing is you have scalability. You can scale out to thousands of machines in a commodity cluster, which traditional database systems cannot do because they assume short running queries. They assume you know, there will be no faults while a query is running if you, because you only can restart queries. You cannot you know, continue a query halfway. And also, Hadoop allowed for schema on read. You don't have to model, which is also a key thing about big data. You don't want to model your data in advance. You build the model while you go along during the analysis. But those two things actually are not enough. And that's, by the way, also one of the things that were, uh, were a system like uh, Hadoop and later on the in-memory Hadoop called Spark have shortcomings because you need iterations. So in addition to two, those two aspects, in order to run any non-trivial data analysis algorithm in machine learning, signal processing, and so on, you need to support iterations. So we added iterations as a first-class citizen. And we built a system called Apache Flink. We called it Stratosphere back then, and we donated it to the Apache Open Source Foundation. And uh, the Apache Open Source Foundation accepted it as a top-level project, as the same level as uh, Hadoop or Spark uh, in 2016. It was one of the fastest projects to make it from incubation to become a top-level project. And it's an open source stream processing framework for distributed, high-performing, always available, and accurate data streaming applications. I talked about the uh, details already, uh, just from a technological perspective. So what the system really does, you, you write your data analysis program in what's the lingua franca of big data nowadays for scalable systems. It's a functional language uh, that you use. In our case, we use Scala, but there's also adapters for Python and so on, similar to what you would do in Spark, uh, for the ones of you who know that. But you can also use a Hadoop kind of compatible way. It does query optimization, it does the stuff that database systems do. It's, it builds a data flow graph, it has a mathematical model for that, and does the optimization, it generates code, it has different implementations for the algorithms in contrast to, uh, in particular, Hadoop, and it will select the right algorithms both in memory and out of core, and it does state checkpointing and so on. And what we were very proud of uh, when Yahoo uh, made some benchmark where they compared for some streaming application, they compared uh, 
Flink, Spark, and Storm. Storm is a traditional streaming system. Storm, however, is a very low-level system that requires systems programming, and uh, essentially you have to do the black and the red circle, whereas in Flink, it's a bit easier to be able to focus on the red circle. You still have to do some things about the black circle. We are not there yet, but you can. And what you see here, so the details are not so important, but you, here you see essentially the latency, which is how long it takes to compute a result when new data is coming in. And you can see that Spark is not very good, which is not a surprise, because Spark is a system that's not really a streaming system. It's a batched system, and the Spark streaming component is based on micro-batches, which is really you make the batches smaller, but you still have overhead. And at the same time, Storm and Flink are pretty much on the same level. That's what you see here. The key difference, though, is uh, Flink is as expressive as Spark in programming. Actually, the programming model for the ones of you who know Spark is very similar, and you can be very effective. I just want to sh uh, conclude with a few more slides on the Flink community to show you what uh, Flink is about. So from the timeline, we started in 2008. Uh, you know, Initiates was a research project with two people. Two of my students, then more professors came about from the greater Berlin area in, uh, in, in the form of a collaborative research unit. Five more professors with their students started to advance the system. Then other people came, in particular from the Swedish Institute of Computer Science. Then the European Institute of Technology got involved. And uh, at some point of time, more and more companies got involved. And that's when it got exciting. Then a startup was founded around it from some students. and. Uh, uh, the system has been donated, or the code has been donated to the Apache Open Source Foundation, and there has been a growing community. What you see here is now, that's the number of members in this open source meetup community in the various countries. Uh, and this is numbers, actually, it's not quite today, I think it's from April. But, uh, and it's interesting because you see an exponential growth, so I didn't update the numbers, they're probably quite a bit higher by now. Um, but you see an exponential growth, and that's the number of people who regularly meet and talk about the system. And at the same time, what you see here is the number of contributors. Contributors is the number of people who really write code. It's not people who use the system, but people who help to advance the system and build it further. Highly engaged users are, for instance, Alibaba in China, who runs uh, the system on 5,000 cores in a 1,000 node cluster. King, an uh, online game company, uh, runs rather complex applications, or Burst Telecom. But there's also many other companies, including Uber, Netflix. But was also important, Google made uh, Flink runner of the Google Cloud data flow. And so it's uh, a, su a system that's quite uh, much plug and place with the uh, overall um, big data ecosystem. With that, uh, just to summarize, if we look at the evolution of those big data platforms, again, I'm talking about the plumbing, so the actually more boring stuff, but it's as important as running water, so I hope you can appreciate it. Uh, the first generation big data was actually traditional relational databases. They are doing big data. The only thing is they're not doing those more complex applications with it, or they have a harder time with it, and that's how this big data term with the Vs and the complexity came got dubbed. But the real problem was really the more advanced algorithms. Hadoop could do one iteration of PageRank. This is really was the key thing when, when Google invented the MapReduce model, or not really invented, kind of publicized it. Uh, uh, that's what, what led to the second generation. And the, everybody who used those systems like Hadoop realized this is really a very hard to use uh, programming model. So, uh, Many people, including CTOs from many companies, got really concerned about this because it's very hard to maintain the code once the people leave. Uh, you have a very hard time to really run those uh, pieces of code. So the third generation then allowed for in-memory performance because Hadoop did fault tolerance always disk-based, so Spark improved on that, got better performance. And the fourth generation now offers streaming and support for iterative algorithms. There's much more to be said about big data. I will not have time for that. but. Uh, if you look at the five dimensions of big data, I talked essentially about technology. That's, I'm a technologist at heart. I talked about the plumbing. There's much more on the technology side and the algorithmic side. But of course, in big data, we also have to worry about the applications. There is legal issues, there are societal issues, and there's also economic issues like new business models and so on. I will not go into this right now, but in Berlin, in the Berlin Big Data Center, and in, in our groups, we obviously are looking at all of those aspects. With that, I thank you very much, and uh, I'm happy for questions. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much.